Well, welcome to Cloud of Witnesses. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we're going to look at the powerful yet sad story of Evan Roberts. He was a man that birthed a great revival that changed Wales. I'm going to focus on Evan Roberts. I have a separate video on the Revival of Wales, and I encourage you to watch that as well. While I will touch on the Revival, my focus in this video is on Evan Roberts and his story, because he was a main character in this Revival. At the time in Wales, at the turn of the 20th century, Wales was in a deep spiritual decline. It had been in one for quite some time. But Wales had a rich history of God moving, and that people would seek God, and God would turn up. God looks for a Gideon. And in Judges chapter 6, it's very interesting in that story that you see before Gideon turns up on the scene that there is a pre-prophet that comes, an unnamed person who brings a warning. And in this early 20th century, God was beginning to stir the hearts of the leaders in the nation of Wales. And many of them are now beginning to gather together to seek God because they recognize the spiritual climate and that, God, we need your spirit to move. It's not going to be some powerful preaching or some great minister. It has to be the Spirit of God moving, and they recognize that. And Dean Howe wrote, David Howe, Take notice, if it were this day, my last message to my fellow countrymen, before being summoned to judgment, that the chief need of my countrymen and my dear nation at present is the spiritual revival through the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. So here one of the top voices recognizes, God, we need the Holy Spirit. We need you to move once again. And there's key people like Seth Joshua, who interestingly enough was born in the middle of 1859, as was the pastor of the Moriah Chapel where Evan Roberts was born. I believe this is no coincidence that God is starting to put pieces together to show that he is in control. God loves to put his fingerprint on things to show you through cycles and patterns that he is the Lord God and he is always in control. We may look at the circumstances and it may look bad and it may look like everything is going to hell in a handbasket, but God is in control and he is able to turn things around. He is able to work mightily and restore and redeem. Revival is a divine assault on society. When revival turns up, it changes everything. And when we capture that, it will give us a burden to realize that, look, it is a bad and dark hour, but if revival breaks out, it changes everything. It impacts not just the church, but it goes beyond the church and, in fact, impacts every area of society. That's why I call it a divine assault. William Booth wrote, and I really love this, we must wake ourselves up, or somebody else will take our place, bear a cross, and thereby rob us of our crown. God has given us, and He begins to call people, and we need to hear that call and wake up and serve our generation. So God is beginning to call. Seth Joshua prayed, Lord, raise somebody up from the mines or the fields, not somebody of great intellect. And I want to underline that because one of the things about Evan Roberts is that he was a nothing and a nobody. Let me quote something the newspapers wrote about him. We find ourselves in the presence of a tall, fair, gracefully built young man who looks younger than his 26 years and who fails to impress as possessing any qualities, intellectual or otherwise, above the average. Except for a smile or some charm and an air of purity about this person, he might easily pass without notice of any kind. Evan Roberts is the son of a sturdy and independent couple who may be taken as the types of the Welsh mining class in Wales. His father is a collier of sterling character, not noted of any specially marked traits, and in this case, as in so many, it is to be the mother that may betray some of the religious simplicity and zeal that's so marked in the son. Oh, wasn't that awesome? Wouldn't you love a newspaper to say that you are basically just nothing unique about you? In fact, an eyewitness wrote, For some years the mind of Mr. Roberts had been turning in the direction of Christian ministry. His spare time was avidly devoted to reading such literature as would assist him in the preparation of his life work. Though his friends with one consent acknowledged his undoubted religious sincerity and unspotted moral character, there does not appear to be manifested to the observant eyes of the village church leaders any outstanding oracle 
gift are special expository brilliance, such as universally expected in Wales in a candidate of such exalted office. Evan Roberts quietly persisted in the pursuit of his dream. Everything religious secured preeminence in his mind and heart. Every one of his acquaintances concluded that Evan intended to be a preacher. He was nothing unique. Gideon tried to I'm the least of the least, but God said, go in this your strength. What? I am with you. God is just looking for an empty vessel that he can put his glory in, that he may confound the wise by using the foolish things of this world. He's just looking for a surrender vessel. David was the brother out in the fields that they forgot about. Samuel turns up and has to say, do you not have another son? And they all of a sudden realize, oh, yes, we have one more out in the fields. God somehow looks at the heart, and those that the world rejects and those the world casts aside are often the ones that God looks on because they are in pursuit of Him. If you are rejected by society, but you are in pursuit of God, you are in a great place for God to use you. God wants people whose hearts are sold out, that mark their lives. God, I am committed to the purpose. I may not be qualified in many ways. And in fact, they all tell me how unqualified I am, but God, I love you, and that's good enough. Evan Roberts was born on June 8th in 1878 in a town of Locker, uh, which is clear, close to Swansea. Now, I'm not going to try to pronounce the Welsh names of these places uh, because I know that I would really butcher them and do them no justice. So please forgive me and give me grace. <coughs> but I'll try to show them on the screen for you uh, so that you can see. I wanted to share some things that Evan Roberts wrote. For 13 years, I had prayed for the Spirit. And this way I was led to pray. William Davis, the deacon, said one night in society, Remember to be faithful. What the Spirit descended, you were absent. Remember Thomas, what a loss. I said to myself, I will have the Spirit. And through all weather, in spite of all difficulties, I went to meetings. Many times seeing other boys with the boats on the tide. And I was tempted to turn back and join them. You see, he sold out. There has to be a place of death where, God, I surrender all to you. It's those that surrender all that I could pursue these things, and I would love to pursue these things. They, 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 there's something I want to do, but God, I'm after you. I'm, I'm hungry for you. I don't want to miss. I don't want to turn up on the day of visitation. Sorry, miss the day of visitation. So there's a faithfulness. Every day, pressing in. Every day, going up, because today may be the day. Many of us, you know, can go through a season of being on fire, but it's not good enough to just have a season of fire. We have to have a continual, everyday perseverance. You know, one of the things we've got to realize about the devil, the devil will attack and, and cannot continue. You see that he has, has no ability to persevere. The call for the church is perseverance because if you persevere, the devil may attack you, but it cannot last. It cannot continue. It will break. And so we need to learn that word perseverance and patience. To continue to pray, to continue to press in, to continue to persevere. Because it's the perseverance in prayer that brings forth change, that changes the spiritual climate. So Evan Roberts, around the age of 12, um, his father is injured in the mine. And Evan Roberts has to quit school and begins to help his father while he's recovering. And during this time of being in the mine, there is an incident where there's an explosion that should have killed Evan Roberts, but he is saved by his Bible, which actually is scorched, and he continues to carry that Bible throughout his revival meetings. The devil somehow recognizes when you've been called by God, and he does everything from your birth to isolate, alienate, and disqualify you. His goal is to somehow bring you to place either by getting a spirit of rejection on you, killing you are somehow getting in the way before you do him harm. And so the devil wanted to do everything to stop Evan Roberts because he recognized that God somehow had called this young man and that there was something dangerous about him. I want to share this because it will give you a better understanding of a little more about Evan Roberts. For 10 or 11 years, I prayed for revival. I could sit up all night and read or talk about revivals. 
It was the Spirit moving me to think about revivals. He fed on revivals. There have been many revivals in the nation of Wales. They had a rich history of God moving and a rich history of great heroes of faith. And so Evan Roberts feeds on this. And this is important because, you know, one of the things I've shown, tried to show is that as we recall and study the revivals of the past and the heroes of the past, it stirs something in the inside of us that God, if you moved in a previous generation, you can move in ours. You know, you look at Gideon. God, I remember the stories of how you moved in a previous generation. We need to teach our children what God, this is what you've done in a previous generation. So they get a faith that God, you can move in ours. That you can look at in a previous generation how dark and how bad it was, but God, you can move in ours. Because as dark and as bleak as it may be, God has been darker and bleak before, and you moved, and everything changed. Revival is a divine assault, and everything changes. And so Evan Roberts feeds on this, and it stirs on the inside of him. And I believe that it created inside him a hunger to see revival in his generation. And we need people like that are willing to press in after God because inside of them there is a hunger. God, we need you to move. How many of us have got that burden? God, we need you to move in this generation. So Evan Roberts, as said, was working in the mines. Um, he finally quits and decides to become a blacksmith. But that doesn't satisfy him. Inside of him, there's the burden to go into ministry. And he does through the pre-exams to get into the Newcastle Emlyn uh, Academy. And around this time, around the spring, I believe it's around 1903, he has an experience. And it said, one Friday last night, uh, one, one Friday night last spring, when I'm praying by my bedside before retiring, I was taken up to a great expanse without time or space. It was communion with God. Before this, a far, before this, a far off God, I had. After that experience, I was awakened every night a little, one, little after one o'clock. This was most strange for me through the years I slept like a rock, and no disturbance in my room would awaken me. From that hour, I was taken up into divine fellowship for about four hours. What it was, I cannot tell you, except that it was divine, and about five o'clock, I allowed again to sleep until about nine. This went on for three months. So he describes this later on as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. So he has this encounter with God where he meets God and has fellowship with God. And in going to um, seminary, one of his greatest concerns going back to study was that he would lose this fellowship time with the Lord God. At the heart of Evan Roberts is this desire to pray and seek. He truly is a man given to a lot of prayer. And in fact, he prayed so much that his landlord would kick him out because she became terrified of this man who kept praying all the time. It's not normal. How many people have been kicked out of something because, you know, you prayed too much? Can that be put on you that, you know, you're labeled as one who prays too much? What an awesome thing to have recorded by you, I pray too much. But Evan Roberts prayed all the time because inside of him there was this burden, and that burden drove him. And he's trying to see God move in his hour. So he goes and uh, in around 1904, he attends a convention where Seth Joshua is present. And it's the closing part of the meeting. And Seth Joshua gets up, makes his prayer, oh Lord, bend us. And Evan Roberts somehow is touched and runs up the front and says, Lord, bend me. And intensely prays. And he gets down and he seeks God. And he's perspiring, he's sweating, he's, he's, he's seeking God. And it's such an event that Seth Joshua had actually recorded it in his, jo in his diary. Uh, but some of the others, leaders of that time, recorded and said that he is a spiritual neurotic. They were concerned that he would cause an uproar. They did not realize that something was beginning to happen that day, but Evan Roberts did. Evan Roberts wrote, Everyone began to pray, and he was waiting for an opportunity to pray. And he said, I held my breath and my legs shivered. And every prayer I asked, shall I now, shall I now pray, is what he was saying. Is it my turn, Lord? Can I? Because one of the things that Evan Roberts got hold of is he would walk in obedience to the Holy Spirit. He did not want to miss. And so he would wait. 
I sidetrack here, but it's important that a lot of the meetings, he would turn up in revival meetings, and they would go on for hours and nothing, nothing happened. There's no feeling, there's no nothing. I've been in meetings, you know, you go and you turn up and nothing's happening. You start to go, well, obviously God hasn't turned up here today. And we want to quit. But Evan Roberts was not that kind of person. He would just wait. He would sit there and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and pray and, pray and wait. And he would do nothing until he felt the Holy Spirit say, now. And then he would get up and all of a sudden, revival would break out. We hate silence. We hate that nothing is. You know, I, I, I've taught a lot of salespeople. One of the things I tell people is don't fear the power of silence. Silence is such a critical thing. That time period of silence, we want to fill the void. We want to somehow, because it, it, it has an impact on us. We don't like silence. We want noise. We want something happening and doing, and we feel like when there's silence, we're failing. And we step in, and a lot of times we miss critical, valuable information. We, there's something powerful happening that we don't realize. That God, so like in that sales meeting, a lot of time you ask a question, and there's silence. The person is thinking about it, and that may be a critical answer you need to know. In the spiritual, that spirit of silence, God is doing something on the heart that you may not see. It is a critical moment. Stay quiet. Let the spirit work and wait, but it doesn't feel like it. God's not asking you how you feel. God is just asking for obedience. And when we walk in obedience, and even when our flesh feels uncomfortable and our mind is going, and all these alarms are going off in the brain saying, something's not right, trust. Trust. We walk by the Spirit, in the Spirit, by the Spirit, in obedience to the Spirit. So Evan Roberts learns an early age to wait. So he says, Lord, should I pray now? Is it my turn? The living force grew and grew, and I almost was bursting. And instantly someone ended prayer. My bosom boiling, I would ever, <coughs> sorry, I would have burst if I had not prayed. What Paul uh, was the verse, God commendeth his love. His face was bathed in perspiration. He cried out, bend me. He was overwhelmed by the verse, God commendeth his Lord towards us. Then a wave of peace flooded his soul, and he became concerned for others. I want to give you an eyewitness account of the event. Almost in desperation, the evangelist prayed fervently at what seemed to be the close of the difficult meeting. Bend us, bend us, bend us, O Lord. Speaking humanly, many believe this was, this was the very sentence that gave birth to the revival. It became famous. Evan Roberts repeated it uh, times without number. A young woman sprang to her feet in terrible agony, Maggie Evans. If my memory serves me right. At this moment, the silent form of a young man rolled off his seat into the aisle. He appeared only to be semi-conscious. God knows the miracle that happened. A lady sitting opposite the young man assured me that he lay prostrate for a considerable time on the floor of the church, sweating profusely. Nothing seemed more certain but that he would die on the spot. Something happened that night in that room. God began to move as Evan Roberts cried out, bend me. Powerful prayer is birthed through intense seasons of prayer in the secret place. You look at great men and women of faith that have stepped up and they pray simple prayers, but there's power behind it. That is not because of the prayer, but it's because of the season in the secret place seeking God. I remember meeting this lady once and... Um, she seemed already nothing, nothing spectacular about her, but she came up to me and she said a word to me. And it was the most deep word. It was a simple word, but something, it shook the whole of the inside of me. And I said, whatever that woman's got, I want. And I realized that you can carry great authority in the spiritual realm by spending quality time in a secret place that somehow when the word comes out, like Jesus, when he met the, the disciples on the way to Emmaus, something burned on the inside of him on the inside of these people. That's what should happen. We empty ourselves of ourselves and God fills us and God begins to pour out through us. It causes a fire to burn in the people. God comes forth from us. He just somehow uses us. We become just a vessel. And what people experience is not what I said. Paul said, I don't preach 
this gospel, uh, sorry, preach this gospel with power, not with persuasive words. It's not how good or how well we preach it, it's the power that's on the words. And you cannot make the Holy Spirit do it. You have to find through a process that place of total surrender in the secret place where the Spirit of God has trust in you and the Spirit of God can now work through you. There is a deep cry from our spirit. There's a deep cry in prayer that breaks through the brazen heavens that doesn't bounce off the ceilings but goes through and penetrates and somehow releases on the earth the purpose and will of God and everybody around knows it. We need to develop that kind of prayer life so that the anointing is on that prayer and God is in it. We've captured the heartbeat of heaven. This night, Evan got a burden for souls. He gets a burden to travel throughout the whole of Wales to preach the gospel, and he's going to pay the people to come with them. To which case, he went and got his life savings and his absolute commitment that we are going to travel the nation of Wales and preach this gospel. When you press in to the Holy of Holies, where the presence is, you first have to die. There has to be a breaking and ending of you, that place of total surrender. You can't get in there unless you die. But in the Holy of Holies is the mercy seat, and everything bows, and everything points to the mercy, which is the very heart of the Father. That has to get in you that from now on, what is the burden of your heart? It is the mercy of God. It is the kindness of God that leads to repentance and it is the mercy of God that is long-suffering that all come to repentance. And you catch hold of that God's desire is so much greater than ours to see revival and to see souls come to the knowledge of Jesus. Daddy God desires a nun perish. He neither sleeps nor slumbers. And he is faithfully waiting working and just looking for people that will stand in the gap that he can use. Returning to school after this phenomenal baptism, studies for the future revivals were more than difficult. They seemed utterly impossible. He discovered to his amazement that something had happened and now concentrated work was a mere druggery. Day and night without ceasing, he prayed, wept, sighed for a great awakening in his beloved Wales. Hours he spent in unbroken, untired intercession to the charge of those who did not understand the symptoms and the secret soul travail. One thing became clear to him. Study was impossible for the young, some un unaccountable reason. He had to surrender unconditionally to this overwhelming, mysterious impulse surging through his sensitive, awakened soul. He is so burdened. What was in the Holy of Holies has gotten into him, and he is burdened that everything, and if he bows, do you understand that the, the cherubim, they bow, everything bows to the mercy. God, we got to see you move. And it breaks you. And all of a sudden, God, you got to move. It goes from a place of where we desire to, it's a holy desperation and a boldness of faith. See, we come before him. He is rewarders of those that diligently seek him. You must first believe and then you must diligently seek him. God, move in this generation. He now realizes that something is about to happen. And he seeks a sign and his Brother, or sorry, his roommate, Sidney Evans, who actually would marry his sister. He finds one day in a garden looking up at the moon. He says, what are you looking at? And he goes over and he looks up and he sees like a hand reaching down from the moon, touching the earth. And he recognized that God was telling him it's time. And God was about to do something in Wales. And they agreed together to believe God for a hundred thousand souls for Jesus. And they would travel throughout Wales and preach this gospel. So Evan Roberts writes a letter to his brother and says, I don't know where you are with the Lord but the Lord has need of you. And he came home on October 31st, 1904. And he meets with his family, and his family, you know, to tell him, I quit school because God is about to move. A revival is coming. And his family flatlined. You know, you come, and you have this great, exciting experience with God, and you're 
this on fire and you want to share it with the people that you're looking for acceptance from and what happens? They're totally confused and they don't get it. But it didn't discourage Evan Roberts and he runs to the church and says, I feel that to share and they give him an opportunity because they fear, you know what, it will fade. And so that night he shares at the youth meeting and he shares for hours and begins to tell him the events and the stories of his life. And um, he refuses to quit until every member of his family that is at that meeting receives the Lord. And it's interesting, and I want it because I brought up why he was concerned for his brother. Later on, he would write to his brother that he needed him. And he said, Dan Roberts, the brother of the great leader, was sent a message. The Lord has need of you. And he has rushed to his brother's assistance. And he said, this is not all wonderful. God is doing great things, and I go according to the bidding of the Holy Spirit. Until two months ago, I worked in a coal mine, and my eyes were very bad, and I had to go see a doctor at Lanley. And a day afterwards, my brother Evan came from the Newcastle emblem with the revival spirit upon him. And he said, Dan, your eyes are going to get better. The Lord has need of you. And the only doctor, I'm sorry, I only saw the doctor once after that. And is it now not strange that my eyes are all right? They're all healed. brother got changed that night of that meeting. He then started the next night and more people started to come. And the next night. And then he has a meeting one night. And his mother's there and, and very few people turn up. He just had a, a, a previous night where there was a great meeting and then this night no one turns up. But it's a weeknight. And it's very easy. You, know, you think you just started to have a breakthrough and now this but I want you to capture the heart of Evan Roberts. His mother around midnight tried to say, I'm away home. And he said, he rebuked her nicely. But basically what he said is, you know, no, 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 now is not time to go because the Spirit of God is not closer than he ever was. And Evan Roberts stayed and he prayed all night. That was Evan Roberts. Here, the situations don't look right, but he has got something bigger because he's had an encounter with God and God is the God of the impossible and he knows that God is about to move and do something and he is just locked in. He has set his face as flint and even though the natural, as his mother said, it is a work day, it is midnight, this is not the time for people to come. In fact, nobody did come. But somebody did turn up, the Holy Spirit, and he was more concerned about that visitation with the Holy Spirit Having that encounter, are we those that are seekers of the truth, that desire that encounter with the Holy Spirit, that Holy Spirit, I will wait a little longer till you turn up. You know, it's interesting that Jesus sometimes delayed and didn't turn up when he was expected. But bless those that dared persevere and wait and hold fast and keep seeking, keep praying, because sometimes you just pray and you got to pray to begin to prayer. You got to keep praying until all of a sudden there's a door opens and you step into something and you know now I have stepped into it. The presence of God has turned up. Perseverance. All precious perseverance and patience in prayer. He wrote certain things became standards to Evan Roberts in every Bible. Certain things that he believed were critical ingredients. He said, you must confess and put away any unconfessed sin. You need to get clean with God and get right with God. The Holy Spirit first comes to convict. He's a spirit of truth and he will convict you. And he's going to expose all darkness in you. Because any darkness in you becomes a trap and an opening to the enemy. And it's time that we open ourselves bare before the Lord. We, like Adam and Eve, love to cover because we want to hide. But it's time for us to open up and say, God, I surrender. I give you full access and unqualified yes to every area of my life. Change me. He then said you must put away any doubtful habit. Anything that something inside of you stirring you is wrong, put it away. You must obey the Spirit promptly. When the Holy Spirit, you need to have that relationship with the Holy Spirit so that you can hear His voice. And when He says something, do it. 
Hear, Holy Spirit, and obey. You must confess Jesus publicly. And this was actually interesting because at the time, they didn't believe in that. This was something they did in Wales. He would insist that people come up the front and publicly confess Jesus as Lord. And many people criticized Evan Roberts for that. And there's certain things that he would do in his ministry that people criticized. He would bring up this group of women that traveled with him. And his style was not to give these long, powerful sermons and messages his style was simply to allow a spontaneity of the Holy Spirit and let the Spirit of God move. Well, anyways, the next day after he has this, what looked like a defeat, but he's prayed through. In the newspapers, an article is written, and it says, A remarkable religious revival is not taking place in Lockler. For some days, a young man named Evan Roberts, a native of the town, has been causing great surprise at Mariah Chapel. The place has been besieged by dense crowds of people unable to obtain admission. Such excitement has prevailed that, that on the road in which the chapel is situated has been lined with people from end to end. Once this got out, you couldn't find a room to rent in that town. It became overwhelmed, flooded with people. People started coming. God's Spirit did the marketing. God started to draw the people and bring them in. And so in the <coughs> November of 1904, the revival now is officially broken out. Evan Roberts would hit the road nonstop for six months, preaching continuously. In fact, he preached for all the way into um, the spring of 1906. But he preaches continuously for six months. He believed, this is what was written regarding, unclerical in appearance, but obedient to the Spirit. There has been no machinery or organization. Too often in our country, we kill all spontaneity in, much, in such meetings by our man-made machinery. We organize a series of meetings to death. In Wales, they hardly have any committee. They rely on the leadership of the Holy Spirit. It is largely a movement of laymen. Evan Roberts tells the people that he shall speak only what the Holy Spirit dictates. He calls himself a divine instrument. The meetings are not dependent upon some famous evangelist. The service consists mainly of prayers, testimonies, and singings. It's powerful what was going on. People would turn up, and they would all of a sudden break forth into a song. There was no hymnals, nor declaration of what song they were to sing, but they'd all start singing the same song, some in Welsh uh, and some in English. As the Spirit led, and they just begin to worship. And they would sometimes worship for hours. And they would then begin to pray. And they'd pray for hours. They would forget uh, that service should have been over hours ago. And they'd forget their, their afternoon dinner and everything else. They suddenly became locked out. And God moved and broke the hearts and brought forth change. Throughout the town and throughout the region, the only theme of conversation among the classes is Evan Roberts. Even the tap rooms, the public houses are given over to discussion to the origin of the powers possessed by him. This is what the newspapers were writing. Everybody now has on their lips Evan Roberts and what is going on. It is impacting everywhere. It is spreading like a fire throughout Wales. People recognize God is beginning to move. Let me share this. A remarkable scene occurred at Mr. Evan Roberts' open air mission at Hollyhead yesterday. There was between 10 to 12,000 people present, and the meeting proceeded.
for three hours without any manifestation of feelings. When Evan Roberts jumped up crying, Where are you, you professing Christians? Why don't you pray? I can do nothing. I leave Hollyhead with a quiet conscience but a wonderful heart and spirit. Then he broke it out into loud weeping and wailing. The audience responded, thousands shouting, wailing, shrieking for mercy. Those who followed the services for months say that nothing like last night's scene had been ever witnessed. After a while, Mr. Roberts waved his arms and shouted, Thank God we can now sing and rejoice. Victory is won. The crowd again responded, leaping to their feet, shouting, Glory, hallelujah, the victory is won. Then there was a triumphant singing, shouting, and cheering. The devil is conquered, cried Mr. Ever, Mr. Roberts. See him fleeing, pursue him, O you army of the Lord. Keep him fleeing from you. So I was talking about, you know, there's meetings where nothing happens for a while, but it didn't deter. There's a pressing in and a pressing forth. There's just that desire, God, I'm locked into you. The five singing sisters, one of them a convert from the stage, who accompanied Evan Roberts, seemed to have a power equal to his own. Three-fourths of every meeting consists of singing. No one uses hymn books. No one gives out the hymns, which are to sung through. The spontaneity of the meeting is astonishingly. It is orderly disorder. We get so concerned of losing control of our services, but the Holy Spirit turned out, and they didn't follow the normal system of, you know, four songs and offering and the preaching. The Spirit of God, when He turns up, and much as He's a gentleman, He also knows He's Lord. And he will do it his way or the highway. And when he turns up, he breaks the mold and he does things according to his desire and his purpose. And sometimes they would just worship. Sometimes they would pray. Sometimes they would make sure worship, prayer, testimonies. He broke the mold. And while it seemed disorder, there was, as they saw, order in it. And lives were changed. Would we be willing to surrender the control of our services to allow the Spirit of God to truly move. If we spend time in the Holy Spirit's presence, in the presence of the Daddy God, until we are changed, and we hear His voice, and His presence now lingers, and we have that aftermath of His presence just lingering on us, and He turns up, we get up to preach, and God says, no, just worship. Will we do it? And see God move. Just get out of the way and let the Spirit of God move. We're going to see revival if we learn to obey and yield to the Spirit. You know, people would begin to laugh, cry, dance, hit the floor. All kinds of things began to happen. As God was moving and the Spirit of God was moving. One of the things I want to touch on, because Evan Roberts wrote of himself, tired not once. God has made me strong and manly. I can face thousands. My body is full of electricity day and night. I have no sleep before I'm back in meetings again. He has said for six months straight, preach consistently, nonstop. He's not sleeping. He's not eating properly. And you know what? You got to take care of this body. Even the Lord God rested on the seventh day. Your body needs rest. One of the papers wrote, The strain of the last few weeks has told precipitately upon Mr. Roberts' nerves, and it is expected that he will have to relinquish the great hold he has on the nation. Thousands travel to see him, and he is in constant demand in all parts of the country. Congregations are simply fascinated by the story of his experiences, and his coming in a district is hailed with joy. Businesses are suspended, and all manner of work is abandoned when he appears. A deep religious feeling pervades the town when he is present. Public houses are closed, and churches are open at all hours. And the only theme of conversation among the classes and sects is Evan Roberts. Evan Roberts was a man who tried to walk extremely humble. He did not want to be the center of the focus. I think in part because of that, he never stepped up to a leadership role that God had called him to. In part, I think he felt disqualified because of his lack of experience and his lack of education. And he realized he didn't have certain gifts, but he didn't realize the purpose and calling that he had. He was a more prophetic type, which everybody recognized. <clears throat> he was not taking care of his body, and as a consequence, he starts to have these breakdowns, and people get concerned. And in fact, when he's in Liverpool, he goes and gets checked out by a doctor where he's declared sane and fine. But the pressure is beginning to break Evan Roberts. 
the strain of it all. He, in 1905, gets persecution. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little more about some of the reasons why later on. But a guy called Peter Price attacks him and attacks him in the area of um, that it's a false revival. That who is this man? He's not qualified. He doesn't have the education, etc., etc. And a lot that's going on in Evan Roberts, I believe, brought him to a place where he was so desiring to walk right with God that he felt, what if I missed it? And he has a nervous breakdown. And in 1906, all of a sudden, at the right time, the spirit of Jezebel turns up in a lady called Penn Lewis. Evan Roberts, many people thought, uh, was having a... Um, Stroke. And this is what one of the papers wrote. With indications of serious indispositions appearing upon him, drastic measures had to be taken immediately if disaster was to be averted. Rumors circulated that already one side of his brain was paralyzed. At this point, Penn Lewis's came into prominence. Impartial persons everywhere believed that these servants of the Lord acted with the purest of motive and did so promptly because of the urgency of the case. They urged Mr. Roberts to take complete rest and pre-offered the hospitality of their beautiful home in the Great Glen, Great Glen in Leicestershire for the purpose. Evan Roberts, you know, needs rest. And the spirit of manipulation control loves to find opportunities when you are at your weakness and it, it uses that weakness to lure you in and to bring you into complete bondage. So Evan Roberts would now go into seclusion, and it was said regarding him, this was an eyewitness, his seclusion was so complete, and the watcher for him so rigid that people feared and even whispered that he was against his will. Many friends concluded that, that such a thing, how could such a thing happen to a person so reduced in health as to be unable to speak for himself? Everyone, everything around him seemed to be shrouded in mystery. Letters addressed him, were unanswered. Friends who surrounded from surrounding districts, including myself, called at the home in the hope of seeing the revivalists for prayer or advice, but could not. Evan Roberts enters this dark season where this lady who has her agenda, she is a woman at the time, of course, women were not in ministry, but she, she actually writes an article and tries to defend women in ministry, and, and she writes several books. And she is trying to use Evan Roberts' credibility to push and advance her agenda. She manipulates, controls him, and she is using, oh, per Evan, the stress of all what you're doing is too much. You need to sit down not get behind the pulpit. You need to be hidden away. His family would turn up and seek him, and he would not even see his family. You know, never lock yourself away from your family. Never lock yourself away from critical people and relationships that you have. This spirit of control was so complete that it was saying, oh, we're here to restore you, but it never does. All it does is slowly kill you and cause you to abort the call. It reduced Evan Roberts in the future years to where, yes, he would write some articles, and in fact, he was claiming part of the writing of the War on the Saints, a book that was full of error that he later denounced. And I've seen one article claim that he never, he claimed he never wrote. She would have him write certain articles in her news, or magazine, a newsletter, uh, but she takes sick for a season, and um, he writes them, and, and people are responding, and it, it disturbs her, that spirit of jealousy, so she cancels that magazine. They turn up to a convention, and she allows him only to pray and counsel. He's not allowed behind the pulpit. She is so complete control over this man, because she is, in quote, restoring him. You know, if the church had been allowed, the way we are today, to restore Peter after he fell to deny Jesus three times, he would have missed the day of Pentecost. We need to take on this spirit of religion that seeks to abuse and take control and manipulate and prevent you being the voice that God has for you. It is so deceptive and it's so easy to get entangled into it. And it takes the victim and it victimizes them until you come to a place where you are so broken that you disqualify, that you look at yourself 
and it shows you, well, how can you? Look how unworthy you are. Look at all the mistakes you made. And you start to see yourself incorrectly. Instead of fixing your eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of your faith, you're now fixed on you. The Bible says, remember the little foxes, the little foxes that spoil the vine, that you're to catch these little foxes. You know, we look at our lives and we love to share about the great giants, the bears, and other things that we've defeated. But the little foxes, the pretty cute little foxes, harmless little foxes, we ignore. Yet the little foxes ruin the vine. The Bible says that we are to run the race with endurance that's set before us, but it says laying aside the weight and the sin. We lay aside and we focus on the sin and we get rid of the sin, but the weight. Those areas of weakness, and I believe in Evan Roberts, was an area of weakness in this emotional area. The Bible said, or John said, I pray that you prosper and be in health, even as your soul prospers. Your mind, your will, and your emotions. You need to be sound in your mind, your will, and your emotions to be effective for God. And you need to take your emotions and ground them in the Lord. Renew your mind. Let the Holy Spirit restore and redeem your mind, your will, and your emotions. Because the devil loves to play in your memories and in your hurts and in your scars and form a root of bitterness that will kill and destroy and make you ineffective. He loves to pollute you through these experiences so that you are no longer the same. And now what goes through the pipes tastes of the stench of the enemy. Evan Roberts would lose a lot of credibility in Wales because of that book, A War of the Saints, and because of this suddenly pulling away and hiding that nobody understood. And it didn't serve the purpose it should have. Yes, he needed rest, but he is locked away for years. And while he makes, he starts a school in 1908, again, everything is sporadic and there's nothing of really stepping out and being the person he was called to be. Around 1919 to 21, somewhere in there he broke away from the Penn Lewises. But he never steps back into Wales. Um, he does come back briefly when he hears his father is sick, I believe around 1926. But somewhere I think around 19, around that time period, Penn Lewis finally dies. And it's only after her death that he finally would come back and live in Wales. He did come back briefly in 1926, uh, but in 1928, he did return to Wales. And somewhere around there, um, his father dies and he gives a eulogy and it breaks forth a revival, this short revival that went from 1928 to 31. That many people hope will once again birth a national revival. But once again, in around 19, the early 1930s, Evan Roberts goes back into seclusion. This time, not because he's had some mental breakdown, not because he's exhausted. This time, he's come to a place where he looks at the nation and there's been a brain drain, there's been a spiritual apathy take over the nation. And he looks at and he suddenly comes to the conclusion that revival is no longer possible in this nation. They don't have the ministers or the people able to do it. And I think, again, you know, he missed the fact that God had chosen him and he was not qualified. That it was a dark season when God brought him forth. He's now looking at the natural instead of seeing things through the eyes of Daddy God. And that God could raise up a nobody that men and women disqualified but God would equip. See, the other thing about God is when God calls you, He equips you and empowers you. When the spirit of religion, it will 
play a game with you, but it will never ever empower you. It will say we are equipping you, but it never does. It constantly moves the goalposts so you never ever achieve or get to the place you need to be. It never empowers you. It will lose you to do something, but never gives you the tools or the authority to do it because it wants you to fail. And then when you fail, it brings you back in and says, well, there you go. It clearly wasn't the time. But God equips and God empowers and God's with you. And God's gone before you. And God was more than able. So the 30s, again, he's in hiding. The 1940s uh, were a period of Great Depression for Evan Roberts. I think in part because of the war. He went into depression. A lot of the poems that he wrote, because he began writing a lot of poetry, are very dark. The Pain of Joy, for example, I believe was one they wrote. And it was greatly impacted because of the war going on. See, Evan Roberts, this weakness that he had in the area of emotion continued. And he never, ever got rid of that little fox, caught that little fox and renewed his mind and broke the thing so that God could really use him. Think how much more God could have done through this man had he surrendered every area. He did so much and gave so much but the emotional area, which was a strength, was also a weakness. Sometimes it's our greatest strength that's our weakness. This great strength of emotionally being able to get out and cry out and seek God and be easily touched is also the area of weakness that he's easily touched and depressed. See, that area needs to be under the Lordship of Jesus. Jesus needs to have the throne of your affection and your emotions. That is a process that we must do daily. Many of us that are emotional need to learn to surrender because if you don't, it becomes a little fox that opens a door and it can cause such a dark period in your life that I believe that Evan Roberts went through. He did finally come out of it towards the end in the late 1940s and became more sociable again. Started meeting back in with his family. But... You know, a lot of times they try to um, commemorate the fourth anniversary, which he really didn't take, take part of. But at this point, he's lost any hope for revival in his nation, and he wants no part of it. He feels that he is to commit himself wholly to prayer. But let me tell you something. <clears throat> Paul wrote this, Woe is me if I do not preach. See, when God puts a call on you, woe is you if you do not follow the call. The the word doesn't say lock yourself away and pray all the time. It says go into the world. Go into your assignment and preach. The command to all of us is do the work of evangelists in season and out. And I think his failure in doing the work were the opening that caused his great depression. Had he just stayed faithful and continued to do. It wasn't his job to look at the result. It was his job to do. It was his job to be obedient. It wasn't his job to look at the spiritual climate and say, well, it's not, they're not ready, God. It was his job to be obedient and do the call. Woe is me if I do not preach. Woe is me. You know, one of the things you will find in your walk with the Lord, if you are not stepping out and doing the call, you go into a very dark season of frustration, discouragement, depression. Because on the inside of you, there is a burden that doesn't quit, doesn't stop. It just continuously stirs on the inside of you, calling you to step up to the plate. And we resist it, and we justify ourselves. And until we surrender and say, Father God, and repent, and I believe that one of the things Evan Robert should have done, repented that a whole pen of his time and, and, and allowing his emotions to have greater authority than the Holy Spirit. Well, Evan Roberts would write in his diary in 1950, ill, and it was the first time he was bedridden. And in January of 1951, he finally went home to be with the Lord. I wanted to, before I share a little bit, um, what people wrote about him. I want to deal with the area of controversy. Did he become Pentecostal or not? A lot of writing criticized him greatly. 
And a lot of it was written and criticized because of the lack of education, which I think impacted him. And ultimately, he became fearful of missing the Lord. I have newspaper articles. I have many eyewitness accounts that talk about people praying in tongues at his service. I can say to you, at the end, someone came, was praying in tongues, and it was uh, a personal meeting with him, and he rebuked him to stop and said, the, the children of the revival are not ready, and if, they, if you do this, they'll get deceived. I can tell you that he did flow in the spirit of discernment. He talked about that and um, said that in a letter that he wrote, that it concerned him uh, initially. And his meetings, he would discern, and he would, some people call it telepathy. And um, many people felt that he was generally a, a true person, but deceived. So there was a lot of controversy because he did flow in certain things. He did flow in that discernment where he would pick out people uh, that would share their testimony and tell them, no, they had not told the truth. And he would tell the truth, and he would expose the truth. He began to prophesy. Now, some of his prophecies were clearly wrong. I think because of that season he went with Penn Lewis is where he opened the door into wrong stuff. He did get in the latter years into laying hands on the sick and many people in the 1920 to 31 mini revival, um, many people talk about the miracles and the healings and the deliverances that occurred during that time period. And that was one of the great signs or markings of that revival is that there were miracles. So to that extent, yes, there's a lot of documentation that clearly suggests the person that birthed Pentecostalism in Britain, the Anglican priest, actually worked with Evan Roberts um, so that you can see an indirect uh, um, Bartleman, part of the Zusa Street, corresponded with Evan Roberts who was part of the, of course, Pentecostal break uh, uh, revival in Azusa Street. I personally question and wonder if part of his mental breakdown was he was beginning to step into Pentecostal things and didn't understand it, was concerned, he was deceived, and that that fear of missing it, because he did write that he thought he was so, he had sinned and he had fallen, and that, it, it, that he had committed the unforgivable sin. And I wonder if that was the basis of it, that he was stepping into things he didn't understand. Again, just an opinion. Regarding whether or not he became Pentecostal or not, I'll leave it with you. As I said, um, Edwin Orr, the evangelical, talks about certain things that he did do. Um, and there's a lot of documentation that would suggest he at least was touching at it. But I will leave that discussion open and I'll leave you to make your own decision on that. Going back to Evan Roberts, let's look at what he did. He was a man who experienced strange things in his youth. He had seemed to hold the nation in the palms of his hands. He endured strains and underwent great changes of opinion and outlook, but his religious convictions remained firm to the end. And he did change. Many of his opinions and thoughts and certain things changed. And he was a different man in his later years than he was in his early years. And I think in part, he had yielded a lot of deception in because of those Penn Lewis's days. Um, some of it he did repent of. But the deep religious conviction and in the heart of it, it was souls for Jesus. He truly was burdened to see souls won for Jesus. I, I've tried to show you, and I have a slide where I will show the number of revivals, a place when he truly covered the nation of Wales and traveled throughout it and preached from one end to the other uh, the gospel. I want to tell an account that was written regarding him and what he accomplished in the nation of Wales. Who can give an account of the lasting blessings of the 1904-1905 revival? Is it possible to tabulate the sum total of family bliss, peace of conscience, brotherly love, and holy conversation? What are the debts that were paid and the enemies reconciled one to another? What are the drunkards who became sober and the prodigals who were restored? Is there a balance that can weigh the burden of sins that was thrown at the foot of the cross? He truly changed the nation. Many, many prostitutes came to the Lord, many drunkards came to the Lord, many of the backs and came back. 
you cannot doubt the impact and the lives that were truly changed and the revival that occurred and the people that were, were converted. <clears throat> Many went on to do great, some famous people came out of it that birthed revivals elsewhere that went into the nations. So there was something powerful that he truly did. He did see 100,000 people come to the Lord in that 1904 through 1905 revival. So the purpose that he set out to accomplish, he did. Was he a great man? I believe he was. Was he imperfect? Yes, he was. And I think there were areas of his life that he failed to surrender, and particularly in the area of emotions. Was he a man who got deceived? Yes. It's hard to fully explain the Penn Lewis thing, but when you understand the power of spiritual abuse, it becomes easier. And I'm going to do an article on that because it's something we need to address. I think it's something we need to stand up, that spirit of religious abuse that seeks to abort calls, kill people, put them on a shelf, and they never ever fully get restored. They take you to a time of weakness and brokenness, and they play on it, and they destroy what God put in you, and they have you focused on you. They victimize you. They shun you. They put you into silence until you are so broken of yourself that you are of no use. God's not trying to break and destroy you. God's trying to build you up and restore you. He's trying to heal you and redeem you. God is trying to bless you. God has a beautiful way of killing the part of you that needs killed, but at the same time, in His presence is fullness of joy. And in His right hand, there's pleasures evermore. When God turns up, God begins to work something in you. And there's a peace, there's a joy. He's not a God who brings this depression, discouragement. He's not a God who brings you to a place where you are just without hope. He's the God of all hope. And when you stand in His presence, He's so full of hope. He'll give you hope for the nation. And that's one of the things that, that, that bothers me, that Evan Roberts lost the hope. He lost the vision. And while he became a man locked away in prayer, I believe that we are supposed to be doers. We're meant to be goers. And that there comes a place that I believe, yes, we need to be people of prayer. Jesus was. We need to spend many, many hours in prayer, but we need to go. You need to do the call. You need to fulfill the purpose of God. Not looking at what you see, but walking in obedience to God. Because even if you just touched one person, what if that one person was another Billy Graham or Evan Roberts? It is not up to you to determine the results. You are to be faithful. Some are given one talent, some are given five, some are given ten. You know what? Be faithful what you got. Do. Don't hide it in the ground. Do. We are to go and to do. We are to be ignited for God and to go and to do. I think that he allowed that spirit that was on Penn Lewis that so beat him down, that stole the hope and aboard the call that he never ever fully recovered to be him. I know Edwin Orr met him at the end and said he was a man of uh, of sharpness of mind, though he was very ill. And many, many people hold him in great respect. And I do too. And I believe he was a genuine voice for the Lord. I believe he missed in certain areas. And I think he did not take care of his physical body and bring his motions under the Lordship of Jesus, which opened the door. And because he stepped into things that he didn't understand, and he was in a weakened state. The enemy came in and he wasn't strong enough to stand up against it. I also believe we need to surround ourselves with right people that can bring us godly counsel and support us so that when we're down, they pick us up. That can bring us a right word and now word to encourage us and to help us. We need godly fathers. Good relationship people. See, I believe that we need to have relationships with the right people to help us and they keep us straight. We need to address the little foxes in our life that ruin the vine, the little tiny cute things that we, that start off, they look like a strength because they're so cute and they are strengths, but they're also our weaknesses. Make sure that every area of our life is surrendered and bended and bowed and yielded to the Lord. And when an area is exposed in us of weakness, 
Let us run to the Lord and surrender to the Lord, but let us keep running the race. Going back to Hebrews 12, that we are to run this race with endurance that is set before us, that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witness, and we can look at the examples of these great heroes of faith, where they succeeded and where they failed, and Larry, so that we do run this race with endurance, that we lay aside every weight and the sin, address it, keeping our eyes fixed on Jesus, not on us, not on the results, not on the criticism of people, not on what people say or think, not even what we think, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. You know, when we get to heaven, we can discuss the results then. Let us just run with perseverance. Not grow weary. You know what? I was never a marathon runner. I was a sprinter. I could run 100 meters really fast, and I was good at it. I, 200 meters started to struggle. And you got more than that? I couldn't do it. I was a sprinter. God doesn't want sprinters. God wants marathon runners. People that persist and persevere and keep going. If we are to ransack the domain of darkness and see a generation one, it must come from people that persevere in prayer and persevere in doing, in going. We need to be goers of the Holy Spirit, doers of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit, let him lead us. Let us say sound in faith by grounding and rooting ourselves in the word, surrounding ourselves with the right people, and run this race, fixing our eyes on Jesus. There are certain people you need to run from, certain doors you need to shut and never open, certain things you need to repent of. We need to keep ourselves following the Spirit. Keep following. Don't let the call be killed softly by being in the wrong place. Dare to be brave enough to stand up and listen to the Holy Spirit that you fulfill the call because woe is you if you do not. Run that race and keep persevering. Learn from Evan Roberts the power of prayer and that persistent prayer and that failure to quit in prayer because it will birth breakthroughs. Learn from Roberts that you got to persevere and that you got to bring your emotions under control. I've seen the danger of emotional eruptions and what happens. I love people like Smith Wigglesworth who locked themselves away for 10 days until they had, were broken by God in certain areas so that they would never be the same because they recognized certain things as unbecoming of a man or minister of the gospel. We need to make sure that every area of our lives is surrendered and yielded to God. Well, I pray that this message is blessed, encouraged, provoked you, challenged you, that you go after God like never before and that you say, God, if you moved in a previous generation, you can move in this. And that God's not looking based on your qualifications that men see, but on the heart and on your yieldedness and surrender. It's built in the time you spend in the secret place. God sees in secret and rewards in public. It's the time spent lingering longer in God's secret holy of holies. Getting to know him that is critical that God uses so that we can become a great vessel that he can use on the earth. And he will not share his glory with you or with any man. He's looking for an empty, frail, earthen vessel to demonstrate his power to this generation through. Well, be blessed and be encouraged. And please, when the, the video of the revival comes and is put up, check it out too. I, I pray it encourages and blesses you as well. Well, be blessed in the precious and glorious name of Jesus. Jesus truly is Lord. Thank you.